Welcome back to the Compass Podcast, where we connect the divine to the everyday. My name is Ryan Dunn. I'm ready to geek out on church in this episode. We're talking with Reverend Heather Jalad about the creative, fun, and innovative ways the church is coming together and meeting the world. It's an invitation to Rethink Church, and as somebody who works with an entity called Rethink Church, I'm uh, pretty excited about this topic. So there's a lot to process in this episode about fresh expressions of church and church innovations. We're going to hear about new expressions of church like dinner church and messy church. It's all inspiring and it gets us thinking about how we individually might both connect with spiritual community and dare I say how we might become involved in leading the church into new areas of witness. Reverend Heather Jalad serves as the Associate Director of Training for Fresh Expressions. Uh, she serves as Community Engagement Pastor at Canon UMC in Snellville, Georgia, and as a specialist for the North Georgia Annual Conference. She pioneered the Common Ground Network, which is a network of fresh church expressions, and the Douglasville Dinner Church in Douglasville, Georgia, as well as Collaborative Dinner Church in Grayson, Georgia. <laughs> it's all pretty cool stuff. So let's geek out on fresh expressions of church here on the Compass Podcast. Yeah, well, I'm excited to nerd out over the ways that ministry is happening. So, you know, in the course of a podcast, sometimes you do some topics that you know are good for your audience, but aren't necessarily things that that you personally find all that engaging. This is not one of those topics. Like we're going to talk about the future of church and the fresh ways that church is being expressed. And that's really something that I tend to geek out on. So I'm really excited for this conversation. So let's talk about the ways that ministry is, is happening. Actually, let's go back in time. <laughs> let's talk to how, where, you, yeah, let's go back to how you got to where you are today in the ways that ministry is happening. So you work with a group called Fresh Expressions. Yes. What led you to that work and what does that work look like? Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Ryan. I'm so glad mm -hmm. to have this conversation. Um, Fresh Expressions is actually a movement that started in the UK with our British Methodist friends uh, and the Anglican Church in England and um, almost tw more than 20 years ago now. And really, it is a, a renewal movement of sorts that really recaptures our Wesleyan roots in so many ways. But um, we, we often say that the, the, the folks in Europe are from our future as far as what the church looks like and the decline hmm. of the church. And, um, and, you know, more than two decades ago, they saw that decline and they said, this is concerning. Uh, let's, let's study it. Cause that's what good Methodists do, I guess, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So let's they formed a commission and they, yes, <laughs> there was a committee. No, anyway, yep. so they did, they did a study. Um, and what they, what they, uh, discovered was that indeed the Holy spirit was continuing to move surprise, surprise, but in some un, um, some unconventional ways and some unconventional non-traditional spaces. And they said, well, gosh, what if we did that on purpose? Um, and when I say mm. non-traditional spaces like your ball fields or your pubs or your coffee houses or, you know, your schoolyards, <clears throat> that Christian community was forming in those places. And um, and so what they what they did is they said, what if we did that on purpose? And that was kind of the birth of the Fresh Expressions movement. So okay. fast forward, that came across the pond and the Fresh Expressions movement um, kind of hit our shores uh more than a decade ago now here in, in North America. So I was introduced to it uh, when I was serving a local church as their, as an associate pastor, uh, uh, very involved in mission and the local community, uh, a lot of uh, mission partnerships and relationships. And I went to, I went to a conference and I don't remember what it was, but I heard Verlin Fosner speak about dinner church mm, and dinner um, church. we could, that's a whole other story, but um, heard him speak about dinner church and um, really the Holy Spirit just said, what if we had a three year long relationship with a local school uh, as a partner in education uh, that was about a mile and a half away from our local church. Uh, highest free and reduced lunch in the county, talking like 98%. Uh, 
uh, free and reduced lunch, uh, which also has other implications, like a lot of single parent families, grandparents raising their grandkids, no working PTA, you know, not the room parents and the room moms and all that kind of stuff going on. And so the church really made the decision that they were going to stand in the gap there. So after three years of doing that and learning about the Fresh Expressions movement and the dinner church possibility, I really felt like the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder and said, what if you did this in this school? And, um, and you know, there are a lot of factors that came into play along the way, but that is where we started our first dinner church here in North Georgia as a United Methodist. And, um, and it actually just had its sixth birthday. So uh, that was kind of my entry into the whole world of Fresh Expressions. Yeah. What did that dinner church look like from the get go? Was it kind of opening up the church facility? Were you going to somebody's house? Was it a restaurant? It was actually in the school cafeteria. Okay. Um, it was a, a public school. And, you know, a, a, one of the things that we talk about in the, the Fresh Expressions movement is this journey that we talk about, this Fresh Expressions journey, which requires listening, paying attention to our community, to what God is doing out there, um, outside the walls of our churches, and where we have those invitations to join God. And because of this relationship and because of a real in real food insecurity, dinner church just made sense. And because of the trust that was built over time and the relationships with the school staff and the school principal and us really showing up, um, knowing people's names, they're knowing they, them knowing our names, et cetera, and stories. Um, the door was opened for us to do that. I, I we went and I shared it with the principal um, with fear and trepidation. And I thought, you know what? The worst she can do is say no. <laughs> but she said, yes, I think that's a great idea. And I was like, what? And, uh, and then she said, let me just check it out with the county office. And I thought, well, surely they're going to say no. Um, and they said yes. There was a real need being served there. And, um, and so we started in the school cafeteria with our first dinner church. Uh, what it looked like were parents and children that were a part of that school, um, much that looked very different from our worshiping congregation, even though it was a mile and a half away, uh, mm. but not folks that were coming into our, you know, into our church building, our traditional forms of worship. And so uh, that community continued to grow. Eventually, we moved to a local food pantry that was two blocks away. It's just a little easier logistically to get in and out of there with school holidays and everything else. Um, and, you know, we were able to be more consistent with what we were doing. There are a lot of feeding programs. How does something like Dinner Church differ from a feeding program? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things, one of the things that we really, one of the characteristics of a fresh expression is that mutuality is the, you know, we're not going to do something to people or for people, but with people. Mm. And there is certainly that, that recognition of, um, uh, the, the, the sacred worth and value of every human <laughs> and the love that God has for them and really, really setting the table for God to show up and, and those relationships to form and develop over time. Uh, what I have learned in the, the dinner church world, um, particularly, is that when you're sitting at a table and sharing a meal with someone, you learn a lot about them. And it is such a level playing ground. We all need to eat. And um, mm -hmm. that is such a, a, um, a significant part of the dinner church is that everybody sits down and eats. We all get to know each other's names. And just like in our churches where everybody sits in the same pews <laughs> all the time, people yeah. tend to sit at the same tables at our dinner churches. And therefore, we're sitting with the same folks. And over time, okay. we learn more and more about one another. It is a family table of sorts. It is, yeah. It's different in that way and, and so many other ways as well. Are there elements of worship? It, it depends. I mean, one of the things that is very important in uh, forming Fresh Expressions is context. And so we don't necessarily want to take what we do on a Sunday morning and then just like prescriptively like lay that over what's happening in that room. Hmm. Um, but yes, there are <laughs> elements of worship. I mean, that would be weird in some places, right? I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of, we talk about dinner church, but it's really like table centered, right? And that can happen in a lot of different contexts. Um, 
but but yes you know there is usually a jesus story shared so there is a story from jesus's life or a story that jesus told and there's some conversation around that um sometimes we have music um there's usually prayer and um and sometimes we celebrate communion together as well Hmm. so it depends on the context so for the folks who were part of your more traditional church expression, when y'all started doing the dinner church, how did you respond to the voice that came up? And I'm sure that this voice came up that asked, no. okay, when are these people going to start coming to real church? Yeah, no, that's absolutely. That is a question that's often asked. Um, and I think the point behind the movement is that this is church. This is church happening where these folks are. And there's a lot of reasons for us to um, to kind of dive into that conversation because those are real concerns, right? When our uh, worship attendance continues to decline, et cetera. But there are a number of factors, you know, that are um, part of that number. And, you know, for, for the most part, we're continuing to do church the way we have for, you know, decades hundreds of years even, um, and primarily uh, we gather on Sunday morning around 11, uh, and that world where that made sense no longer exists, uh, Mm -hmm. where we had, you know, everything shut down on Sunday and no one did anything else, and we catered to the farmer's schedule and (laughs) all of those other things. I mean, that's no longer a reality. We live in a 24-7 world, oftentimes even if people wanted to come be a part of a worshiping community, their work, their schedule is prohibitive. Um, with, you know, with single parent families, it's I, it's super hard to get out the door with your kids on a Sunday morning. If that is literally the only morning, you don't have to run out the door. Yeah. Uh, hmm. And so, you know, Fresh Expressions is really very much about meeting people where they are and forming church there. And so taking um, a lot of those factors into consideration, I think, are important. Also, I mean, to be quite honest, the the building can be an obstacle for some folks. I mean, you know, a little bit of a a background of my story. When I first walked in the church building, I thought it was going to fall in on me. So (laughs) (laughs) I was a little bit uh, intimidated. Mm. I didn't actually go into the sanctuary for many, many weeks. I sat Uh outside and listened to the sermon because I was afraid I was going to mess something up or do something wrong. If we had all the time in the world, we would unpack that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll keep it on the fresh expression side of, that, uh, of the conversation. Um, well, it sounds like you, in your personal story, you got pulled into the fresh expressions through meeting the need in, in your local church. But you're now part of this kind of nationwide movement of fresh expressions. What was it about that movement that made you want to continue with it? What was the need that you were seeing or what was the passion that it was scratching the itch yeah. that the passion put out? I don't know, awful question, well, you but know, you know where I'm going. I think a lot of us, um, both clergy and laity are doing some of these things already. And when I encountered, and I certainly had done that in my, um, uh, mission and community engagement was very, very integral to my own formation, I would say that. And then secondly, um, in my first local pastor appointment, I was doing things that you would call fresh expressions, but I didn't have the language for it. Mm. And so when I finally like got that language, it was as if I was like, oh my gosh, these people get me. Like they, you know, oh, this is actually a thing and I'm not crazy. And, you know, so uh, I felt like I found my tribe, if you will. And um, and so that is really kind of what drew me in. It's like, this is what God has shaped me for, called me for, gifted me for. And um, it just felt like a puzzle piece was, you know, that, that last piece was put in the puzzle uh, when, when I discovered the Fresh Expressions movement. And um, it's kind of been, I'm all in from there. Yeah. Well, in one of your roles with the Fresh Expressions Movement, you host the podcast. Yes. Uh, and for sure, in that context, get to hear all kinds of stories. What are some of the ways that, um, or some of the inspiring stories or innovative stories you've heard through your experience with Fresh Expressions? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question, because I think that 
some people have kind of stumbled on this movement, not on purpose, right? <laughs> and I'm thinking of two two people in particular that were both church planters that really were kind of starting a, a traditional, you know, model of church where, you know, a large investment was made in facilities and um, all the resources that you need to do that and all the on-ramps. And, and in one case, there was just such a discontent with diminishing returns on that investment. Mm. Um, in the other case, uh, the pandemic kind of made them have to shift how they were gathering. And, and it, it wasn't like um, things were going swimmingly well with their traditional plant prior to that. And this is not a, this is not like a, 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 um, a testimony on why church planting is bad. I, I, it, there are contexts where that absolutely makes sense. But sure. the, these two pastors in particular were willing to, like, almost stand in a different place in the room and say, what if we did this? Uh, or see what God did when they had to shift gears and do things differently and say, well, gosh, this feels like what we're supposed to be doing. This is where we're seeing, you know, a great return on the investment that we're making in our community and in these relationships. And we are seeing more and more unchurched and de-churched people come and be a part of this versus, you know, for better or worse, playing musical chairs from one church to another. Mm. Mm. So uh, both in both of those cases, these pastors had a, again, a traditional church plant that actually shifted to a table-centered gathering. Okay. What do you mean yeah. by table-centered gathering? Well, like a dinner church. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Meal-centered um, in it. very different places in the country, one in Colorado and um, uh, the other in Minnesota. So hmm. there you go. Yeah. All right. So what did their expressions look like at the beginning? I mean, once they moved past that initial, like, we're going to plop down in this neighborhood, we're going to put together a Sunday morning worship service. Once they moved past that phase and they're like, that's not going to work. We got to yeah. do this other thing. Yeah. What did those initial expressions look like? So one ended up in more of a, more or less like a community center space rather mm -hmm. than kind of this, you know, traditional church building. The other, and, and then by virtue of, we talk a lot about third spaces in Fresh Expressions mm -hmm. that are kind of those places that we frequent in our communities, like the coffee shop or the gym, or that they're just openly accessible. We all know the rules of engagement. We can pretty much anticipate what's going to happen when we walk in the door. It feels free and open, unlike my like fear and trepidation of walking into a church building for the first time. Right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but people feel people feel more at ease in walking into these spaces or more, more comfortable. They feel more accessible. So um, the, the, the one in Colorado ended up in a, like a community center of sorts. Um, uh, that's the one in Colorado. The other one in Minnesota really kind of had to uh, experiment with what it looked like to gather because they had gone from actually uh, worshiping in a school uh, that obviously they couldn't continue to worship in during the pandemic because a lot of our schools were, were closed. And, and again, mm. to be to be quite honest, they had really uh, dropped significantly in their worship attendance at that point already. But they, they did different experiments like gathering in a public park and having a picnic that uh, was just very invitational and hospitable to the people that were around them to also um, partnering with a, um, a local ministry that they were a part of that was feeding people. So it's almost the... Um, uh, the the convergence of all of these things which was very much like what happened in the my first inner church in um you know that i started it's a convergence of what the church is already doing and how can mm. we next level those things relationally incarnationally I, I think a lot of our churches do a great job of <clears throat> gathering supplies and donating things but it's absolutely um absent that 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 relational quality can often be absent we don't know the stories we don't yeah. know the names we don't know the faces it is the two or the four it's not the with and um and so i i think these opportunities can certainly help us move in that direction hmm. you talked about the church kind of utilizing third spaces to yeah. meet people 
have there been some just plain bizarre or really surprising third spaces you've heard that have been effective? Um, you know, what we see a little bit uh, growing a little bit here uh, in like the North Georgia, North Georgia or southeastern jurisdiction of, of the United Methodist Church is more of these outdoor um, type groups, whether it be hiking hmm. or some type of outdoor adventuring. Um, we have fresh expressions that um, have started with like white water rafting. So, I mean, you know, the, to me, that's not something that's on my radar <laughs> that I would necessarily be thinking about. Um, but then we also have, you know, we also have some that are, um, you know, that are just in a coffee house or mm -hmm. in a brew pub or something like that where um, where people are hanging out and getting to know each other and then beginning to – I say that a fresh expression by, by definition is a community of people that is moving together toward Jesus. And mm. while it doesn't necessarily start that way, that's really kind of where, you know, where, uh, where fresh expressions begin to go. Mm. That's cool. Well, in your experience in doing the podcast and in helping other people start fresh expressions, have there been some other innovative expressions that you would really love to shed some light on or things that might inspire some other people? Yeah, so um, I actually interviewed somebody recently on the Fresh Expressions podcast named Marcus Corey, and um, he actually works at uh, the Loon Mountain Ski Resort in New Hampshire. And as a young man, just had such a love for all the winter sports. And <clears throat> there, again, for him, it was um, just a convergence of the things that he loved, um, what he was passionate about, and his faith. Mm. Uh, my, and so he started a fresh expression that um, really seeks to, to form co Christian community with the people that are really regulars. Uh, that are coming to this resort to ski, as yeah. well as the just the whole team that makes what's happening there possible. Um, and again, I think, you know, we talk about third spaces and those um, affinity groups being kind of the birthplace for fresh expressions to happen or potentially needs in our communities, networks that we're already a part of. But our passions are an important part of that, too. The things that we love, um, the things that, you know, get us up in the morning. And, um, you know, I've almost started drawing this Venn diagram of, of this is where this is the thing that I love and this is my life in Christ. And the intersection of those two things is where fresh expressions have the possibility for happening. Oh, and, that's really cool. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I think we really need to think about um, what we're passionate about, what we love. And, you know, for some folks, it's it's justice issues. I see that happening a lot more as mm. well. Certain areas of um, social justice that people are very passionate about. And so you have this core group form. And, off, you know, oftentimes folks that are unchurched or dechurched, you know, very much want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. You know, I would say that is the image of God that is in them. Yeah. They want to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves, and they're passionate about fighting for those particular things. And that is a place where Christian community can form as well. Hmm. All right. Well, that, that might touch then on some of the trends that you see forming. Are there some expressions that are coming up that you tend to see a, again and again? Dinner Church is probably one of those, but are Very there some much others? So. Hmm? Very much so. I think that that movement is just continuing to grow. Um, you know, it, it as far as the Fresh Expressions um, movement is concerned in this country, that, you know, the the godfather of the movement, if you will, is Verlin Fosner, who kind of started this out in the Seattle area. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, as as we talk about, you know, Europe being from our future, oftentimes, um, you know, the 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 West Coast <laughs> kind of comes what's happening on the West Coast kind of comes across the country as well. Hmm. Um, so, yes, dinner church, I think a lot of people have gravitated toward for a number of reasons. First of all, you know, the isolation of the pandemic has been felt. It is it is a, a pandemic in and of itself, you know, an epidemic, certainly in our country. That's that that isolation yeah. and that loneliness and being able to be a part of a tabled centered community. I mean, you know, I don't have to tell you or anybody that's listening that, you know, the, the family meal is uh 
you know, more and more absent from the reality of our everyday lives. And it's just, it, it's becoming more and more unique that people can connect around the table. So yeah, I think meal-centered for sure. I think another reason that that con continues to kind of grow in its popularity is to some degree is there there is a form to it. It is, while it still needs to be contextual, we need to be sensitive to, to the context and to the people and to the, you know, why and the who. Um, it is a little bit more, it has a bit more of an order to it, if you will. Um, you know, you do, you do typically have a, a blessing or an opening prayer. You do okay. share food together and there's conversation. And then the other elements that come into play, whether they're specific ways that you worship together, um, you know, those, those are kind of up for for grabs as far as what the context is. So I think it's been a little bit easier for people to grasp what the dinner church movement is about. I mean, my goodness, we think about all the meals that Jesus ate with people mm. in the scriptures too, and all the different people that were at those tables, you know, yeah. mm. from the Pharisees to the notorious sinners, right? So <laughs> um, it is such a common ground for all of us. I think another movement that I, I continue to see kind of rising as far as fresh expressions are concerned is, is what we would call our messy churches, um, okay. which, again, was adjacent to the fresh expressions movement starting in the UK, has also come over to the States. Again, a little bit more adjacent to what we call church to some degree. Um, but it know, is some of us call all church messy church, but <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I know some people are like, Ooh, off put <laughs> by, the, uh, by the whole idea of messy church. But, um, again, it feels more accessible. It's intergenerational, multi-generational. Um, you don't have to be still and sit still and be quiet. Um, there, it's very interactive and there is, there is a meal included. Um, so yeah, messy churches, I think are growing in their, um, popularity and, and dinner churches for sure. All right. So what, it's not, probably not the meal that makes the messy church, the messy church. What, what is the messy aspect of a messy church? Uh, I would say that it is, again, it's, um, it's not quiet and you don't sit still and there mm. is a sort of an, there is a sort of an order. There are elements that you include certainly right there is there is a worship there is a bible story there is a blessing and a meal that shared sometimes there's songs sung but there's also like games and you know interactive art projects and things like that um for the whole family not just for the kiddos it's not something you you drop them off at but that everybody does together and so, yeah, it's not just coming and sitting for an hour. It's it's very interactive and engaging and, and probably unpredictable, hmm. like most of our fresh expressions are. <laughs> and do you find that, that churches are using the, the messy church model within their own facilities, or is this something else that they're taking out into the community? Both. Um, really, even in, in our um, area here in North Georgia, we have some folks that um, are using their churches and then some that are doing it in like public spaces like parks or, or whatever. So, um, but yes, uh, unlike a lot of our uh, more contextual fresh expressions that are out in those third spaces with those affinity groups in the community, um, our messy churches do tend to gather more in, um, in a traditional church. However, at non-traditional times, on non-traditional days, hmm. and um, and what makes sense for that particular community, it might be um, late on a Sunday afternoon, it might be on a Saturday morning, you know, it might be a Wednesday evening, whatever makes sense for the rhythms of your larger community, okay. um, I think is important. And for us to figure that out, we, we really have to take the time to pay attention to, um, to our community, to spend hmm. time out there, to listen and to ask questions and we need to be better question askers <laughs> for yeah. sure. Mm. Um, so I think that that's part of the fresh expressions journey is, is listening and paying attention. Yeah. So it's not just a matter of a church saying, well, dinner church or messy church, that sounds like a lot of fun. We're going to start mm. this program, but really right. it's, it's responding to like, Oh, exactly. our community Yes. May benefit from. Right. You know. And that's that's really kind of counter to how we've done church. Right. Yeah. Because when mm -hmm. we think very programmatically, we will create something and say, come to our thing. 
Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And rather than what makes sense for you and the rhythm of your life and how can we meet you where you are. And so one of the, one of the stories that I always tell is that when we started that first dinner church, um, and I've, I've started three now in different contexts and different appointments and different places. But um, when we started that first one was that um, it ended up meeting on a Saturday night, which was so inconvenient for me. And mm. so, incon- I mean, I preached every Sunday, right? Because, right? Yeah, right. The flow of your life is, yeah, I got to get that sermon done on Saturday night, right? <laughs> uh, it was it was very inconvenient, um, and and uh, frankly, an inconvenient for the team that helped start that, right? Because um, they were all very engaged and involved in our you know our traditional you know rhythms of the church and served very generously with their time, et cetera. Um, but we also actually engaged new people that were not serving in those traditional roles in the church. That were like, "This is something I want to do. This over. I don't want to usher. I don't want to greet. But this is something I want to do." So anyway, um, we looked at this 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 real food insecurity, and we said, "These are the people. This is why we're doing it. This is who we're we're looking to build relationships with and form community with." If kids eat their last, you know, free and reduced lunch on on um, Friday afternoon and don't eat again till Monday morning, the midpoint of that is Saturday night. Mm. So, you know, really understanding our who and our why uh, was absolutely integral to how we went about and what we did. Well, it seems like dinner church, messy church are both growing in popularity. Have there been some instances, expressions, some affinity groups that you've come across that you wish would kind of grow in popularity are just super attractive to you personally? Personally, I love hanging out in coffee shops. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, I say coffee is my love language. I know my mm. husband loves me if he sets the coffee for me in the morning. Um, oh. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I, I think that there's just something magic happening in, you know, in coffee shops. Hmm. I, I don't know about you, Ryan, but I, you know, I, when I do like, you know, decide to go do some work in a coffee shop or whatever, the conversations that I overhear, um, tell me a lot about the people in my community, but oftentimes yeah. are spiritual conversations. <laughs> And so, you know, if I had the, the time and all the time in the world to do that, I would do that. I think another another thing that I would like to see more of, particularly in our um, kind of emerging reality, not only in the church in North America, but even in our denomination, is more house churches hmm. and networks of house churches. I think there's a, a lot of big opportunities there. Um I wrote my dissertation on on catalyzing effective discipleship um, through starting Fresh Expressions of Church. And what I think Fresh Expressions does is really put some um, some flesh on who it is that we say we are as followers of Jesus, because most of our understanding of discipleship has been equated to um, a class, a curriculum. Mm. Um, you know, a Bible study or, or even, you know, coming to worship on Sunday morning. And we have, um, you know, it's, that's pretty anemic in yeah. our understanding of what it means to be a, a follower of Jesus. And I think that, you know, these, these expressions of church, these new forms of church really do not only equip and empower the everyday missionary that's sitting in our pews, but gives them those practical embodied ways of living out their their faith. And so, I mean, I don't know why every one of our churches doesn't have a number of fresh expressions coming out of it. Um, and, you know, I think house churches is a great, a great way um, to, to potentially practice doing that as well. You know, that's an important point to bring up because in – our normal church setting, there can be this default setting where we kind of leave the process of discipleship to be implemented by the quote unquote paid professionals, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you find that a lot of these fresh expressions are started by people who are on the volunteer level or may not have like the ordained credentials? Yes. I mean, that, th- th- again, it certainly recaptures our, our roots, our Wesleyan hmm. roots. And, you know, when, 
when you know when Wesley was setting up the the class meetings and the band meetings and these were these were being led by everyday people even the circuit riders when they weren't there right that that gathering that gathered community was being led by by a lay person typically um <clears throat> but but yeah I think we're we're moving more in that direction that's something that I would like to see a lot more of um uh, you know, and, and this looks different in every church, right? And I can tell you, you know, I get to, you know, walk with churches across the country and doing this. And in some churches, those pastors, the pastoral leadership is absolutely on board with deploying those everyday missionaries, empowering them, releasing them, permission giving, all of that. And in other places, I think there's there's still a wrestling match going on there. Um, mm. And, you know, one of the uh, anyway, I, we could go on a whole rabbit trail in that regard, <laughs> but I, I do think that this is a big opportunity for us in the church to be able to identify um, the folks that are what we would call pioneers, that have that missional impulse within them, that have those pioneer gifts, or what Paul refers to in the apes gifts of the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists, Right that are shaped that way and and to be quite honest i think a lot of our church a lot of our church history has elevated the gifts of shepherd and teacher we also expect our pastors to have those gifts and so when we mm. get apostle lead pastors we don't know what to do with them <laughs> um <laughs> that's another conversation too um but but being able to recognize those gifts um within the body because those are sometimes the folks that are like you're telling me that I am now a follower of Jesus and basically, you know, the next step for me is taking some classes or, uh, you know, being an usher. And mm. we need our ushers, so don't hear right, me wrong. Yeah. Very but important there, work, but... <laughs> yeah, but there are those apostle prophet evangelists that are like, there's got to be more. You know, mm. I, I feel like I'm supposed to be doing something else. I have a real concern for the people that aren't yet here or that don't yet have that living, breathing relationship with God. Like, what do I do with that? And so I feel like this is almost, this almost provides a framework for for folks to to do something with that and not necessarily oh this is one more thing i have to do but where do those passions that i have that love that i have or those affinity groups that i'm a part of or that place where everybody knows my name um mm. all kind of converge in my life converge with my life in christ and and you know what does that look like for me mm. Mm. that's a really powerful idea that this idea of fresh expressions really kind of calls the church out of herself that yes. it's not just the church existing for the sake of the church, but the church existing to uh, sort of, is that centrifugally, centripetally yes. uh, move yes. out yes. into the world? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And not only that, so not only that, but the, the impact on those disciples um, coming back to their their church, their sending church, their church, their worshiping community that kind of sent them out, and what they bring back that kind of disrupts the reality and mm. and and forces us to ask new questions and maybe get a little bit uncomfortable and you know all of those things that bring about change and that you know I know that's a dirty word to some folks but I mean if we're honest <laughs> it's a scary you know, word I mean, right <laughs> that is that's that's the Christian journey I mean if we're called to the sanctification mm. you know then we're constantly changing and being transformed and so I think these are beautiful disruptors to mm. maybe some of the um you know some of the defaults that we're all um, very comfortable in I appreciate you bringing that up because it alleviates my confusion over the word centripetal and centrifugal <laughs> and that it's both, right? The church is both. It, it moves out while drawing within to the center. It just the gathered yeah. in the scattered. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. We're smothered and covered. Like we say here in Georgia at the waffle. House. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you're the waffle house. But. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, have there been some some books, some authors that have really inspired you intellectually or theology or theologically in pursuit of of seeking fresh expressions? 
Oh my goodness. Um, I have like a whole bibliography. I'm asking for me. Who do I want to oh. read next? <laughs> I was going to say, I have a whole bibliography I can send you from my dissertation, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I mean, you know, Mike Moyna, Church of England, I would call him one of the, the godfathers of the movement and the Fresh Expressions movement there, um, has really written prolifically on the movement and really, you know, was was integral in this whole idea of a Fresh Expressions journey at looking at. Uh, movements across Christian history. It's not something we just like pulled out of thin air, but really um, was attentive to kind of how those movements emerged mm. um, across uh, Christian history and, and, and the the factors that were held in common with each of them. That's kind of how the, the Fresh, Ex- Fresh Expressions journey came about. So Mike Moyna, certainly. Um, Michael Beck here in the States has written, you know, again, also prolifically. I think the man writes a book every night when he goes before he goes to bed. But I feel um, like every time I log on to Facebook, he's making a book announcement. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's the truth. But yes, Michael Beck for sure. Um, gosh. The, uh, Luke Edwards, um, Western North Carolina Conference, wrote a book that I, I pretty much uh, recommend to everybody now called Becoming Church. And he uses the backdrop of hiking the Appalachian Trail as a metaphor for becoming church. Really accessible, you know, very easy to read, but also very deep in what it offers to the possibilities of of starting a fresh expression and pioneering these new forms of church. Mm. Those would be my suggest. Those would be at the top of my list for sure. And we had Luke on the show back in uh, sometime in 2020, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was before he wrote the book. So you need to have him oh, on again. Right. Okay. All oh, right. Let's yeah. Back to that. I mean, his gosh, his his website on the listening church is also mm. fantastic. If if you haven't checked that out, I highly encourage you to do so. Oh. Well, what's in store for you? Are you working on some new projects, ideating your own fresh expression into the future, anything like that? So for me, um, I just took on the role of Associate Director of Training for Fresh Expressions North America. So that's kind of new territory. Um, Some of the things that are different in the year to come is we're doing a lot more um, kind of smaller regional gatherings and immersive experiences. We we have a, an outdoor winter sports immersive experience that's happening in March. Um, we have one um, the outdoor adventuring in, uh, in May that's coming up. But we're also going to be doing some more regional um, conferences. So I'm excited to, to be a part of those. Those will be coming in the fall of this year. As far as myself, um, we just celebrated the one, the first birthday of a collaborative dinner church that we started um, where I'm at here that was actually two different uh, United Methodist churches coming together with a local food co-op and mm. starting a dinner church gathering. So that's been amazing and wonderful. I'm looking forward to, in the year to come, um, potentially starting a, a network of micro churches myself. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see if, uh, if God sees fit to make that possible, but that's, that's the vision that I have. That's the vision I've been given mm. and that I'm hopeful to, to be able to live into. I have been very inspired by the Tampa underground and the Kansas city underground, which are micro church, uh, networks and, um, and kind of looking to them, uh, to, to how that happened and taking a page from them and, and kind of getting started and getting some some things in play. So that, that is really what I'm looking forward to in the new year. Awesome. Well, well, many blessings on you in those endeavors. I'd love to be able to check in and, and hear how the, uh, I don't know, the, the North Georgia underground is coming. Something like you that. Set up the, yeah. Something like that. We'll see. <laughs> well, Thanks Ryan. Yeah. And, and as far as some of the resources go and people who want to uh, maybe get a little piece of training within dinner church or take their next steps in messy church. Is there a specific spot to look for some of that information? Yeah. I mean, we have our website, freshexpressions.com, freshexpressions.com. Um, if you click on that homepage, you can click on training and there's all different kinds of opportunities that you can find there. 
Um, <clears throat> we also have an FXUM um, uh, page now as well. And I will probably have to email you the link to that because I can't remember exactly what it is. But it does come under Discipleship Ministries for the United Methodist Church. So we have some different um, training possibilities there as well and training events. So lots of things for people to check out and love to have more conversations with you and walk with you on this Fresh Expressions journey. Cool. And with that, our geeky dive into church models is complete. If you have any thoughts, questions, or personal experiences you'd like to share, we encourage you to reach out to us through email. You can email us at rethinkchurch at umcom.org. I'd love to hear some of your ideas for fresh expressions of church. If you could use a little more inspiration, well, then check out episode 118 about artificial intelligence and your spiritual journey, just kind of new, innovative stuff. Or you can check out episode 111. There we talk about church and institutions, and that episode addresses some of the reasons people might not want to connect with a church. While you're listening, please do leave a rating and or a review. It helps out a ton. The Compass Podcast is brought to you by United Methodist Communications. We'll be back with a new episode in two weeks' time. I will chat at you then. Peace.